Okay, so the next one is from a fella Haberick. He says, Hi, Doc. I've been reading about several peptides like epimorlin, secretagogues like MK677, and of course GH, etc., etc. Do you have a recommendation of a, an addition to complement TRT for long term, relatively safe, affordable, and sustainable use that I can take side by side with TRT permanently? My goal is to help with staying cut and maintaining and or growing muscle long term. I'm a 33-year-old male on TRT. Love your content. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah, I mean, we kind of just went over this a little we'll bit because of the yeah. peptides. Yeah. Um, you mentioned some good ones, though. Uh, you left out CJC1295, but Epimorlin's a good one. Um, MK677 or Ibutamorin, great one. Um, I don't recommend GH. We've talked about how GH is... Uh, illegal to prescribe anyway, unless you've got uh, roughly seven different wasting disorders. Uh, so you would rather them. just so just to stop there, but you would yeah. rather use M MK six seven seven than growth hormone, even if you could get it. Like if you have your choice between the two, would you rather just if we it? had free market? Yes, and you can get whatever you want. Yes, legally. Like name a country, but don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're out there. Or you just walk in. Yeah, you know, I've heard toilet coins. Cool. You just yeah, here's the money. Here's what I want. But no, because and here's why. Because especially this this fellow is thirty three years old. If you can get your body to produce it rather than shut down your own production, doesn't that sound like a much more elegant way of doing it anyway? Yeah. Now, is it natural? Heck no. <laughs> but you're not shutting down your own production, your natural production of it, if you will, to use the word differently, but mm -hmm. the same word. So if I can get my endogenous production up rather than use exogenous, then well, think of it this way, too. Aside from just neater that way, what about if you ever run out of growth hormone or you run out of the secretagogue? In the case we're using the growth hormone, you've suppressed your own production. you got to wait for your own production to come back if it ever does. It usually does with growth hormone. But with the secretagogue, you told your body to go from its natural, if you will, level of here to here. So you got your 33-year-old level of, say, 200 and we're using IGF-1 as a measure, okay? Then you go to, I've seen things that aren't supposed to be possible. Let's say you go to 350 though, something you had when you were 20, and then you don't take it anymore for whatever reason, then you go back down to 200 rather than close to zero. Yeah. Doesn't that in and of itself sound better? And how about another one? Well, again, we already talked about the illegalities of physicians prescribing it anyway. Mm -hmm. How about the cost? Oh my God. Have you seen what growth hormone costs? Easily, at least on the market right now, at least 600. Even if you have a wasting disorder, and I've got patients uh, 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 that have HIV, which uh, you know will allow a patient, an insurance company will cover, in other words, will subsidize the cost of growth hormone. It's ridiculous. I, I think you're talking about, uh, forget about subsidies, you're talking about anywhere from 1200 to $2,000 a month for growth hormone. That's crazy compared to Ibutamorin's a couple hundred dollars a month, I think, you know? I mean, that's 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 a big difference. Yeah. So on every level I can think of, now, you're, you're better off. Now, if you're talking about, you know, what I really consider crazy bodybuilder dosages, where yeah. I've heard guys using, well, I say bodybuilder doses, not, not to pick on them. Even the HIV literature is kind of nuts where you're using nine I use in the morning and nine I use at night. I have that, that 18 nice. I use a day and what, one bottle, one yeah. vial. Yeah, well that's why they give you sterile water instead of bacterial static water. You're supposed to use it like that. Yeah. Uh, that's where I think the medicine is, is backwards and we gotta go back and revisit that. But uh, that aside, <clears throat> even if you talk to, and I won't name names, but you know the guys that have been training the top bodybuilders in the world. <clears throat> if you talk to guys like that, They'll tell you, yeah, five, maybe six I use, but really, you know, that's just because they're nervous about, you know, what they're going to look like on stage. Four, maybe five tops. And that's for bodybuilder dose, okay? I, I've seen guys that use exogenous growth hormone, three, maybe four I use, and they'll get their IGF-1 to somewhere around 350, 400. 350 is what, you know, 350 to 400 is what you're producing at your max, Typically, when you're growing, 16 to, oh, okay. to 20 something years old. Okay. That's your peak. Okay. Um, and, and you know, we can take a step back from this and go, what does that have to do with anything, Rand? Does that mean it's necessarily good for you when you're 33? I'm not saying yes or no. We still there's a lot of juries, plural, still out on what the best 
is for, and then we go, for what? For longevity, to avoid cancer, yeah. to have a better quality of life. So, I mean, this gets really convoluted when we start, you know, hashing it out. But if you want to keep it within physiologic range, then you don't need more than three or four IUs of exogenous growth hormone. If you can do that with a, with a secreted guy, then why not? Why doesn't every bodybuilder that I've, no. Why is everybody using exogenous versus the MTFC? Is it because they don't know about it or? Well, because the bodybuilders are trying to go supra physiologic because it leverages the fat loss and some muscle gain that much more so. I mean, it's, okay. it's, it's definitely, if, if that is your sole goal, Yeah. and I'm not saying that longevity isn't your goal or that you're sacrificing for it, although there's some studies that would argue that, yeah. but that aside, there's no doubt that using you know five or six IUs is gonna help dice you up for the show more so than, I don't care if you use 50 milligrams of ibutamorin because there's a negative feedback loop and there's only so much your body will produce. Now, I said earlier, at some point, I've seen some numbers that aren't supposed to happen given a negative feedback loop. I've seen a, an IGF-1 of 464 and you go, that's not supposed to happen, man. Really? Yeah, that's with ibutamorin too. Really? 25 milligrams. Um, wow. And I've seen it more than once and I, I, you know, was I there making sure they weren't using exogenous GH? No. Yeah. But they were using ibutamorin and, you know, enough of these were, you know, in my judgment, they weren't lying to me. Uh, but my point being that, you know, typically you're going to be limited to somewhere under 400, you know, between 300 and 400 for your IGF-1, again, reflecting your GH levels. Where, and, and with uh, exogenous GH, you can exceed that and therefore get more benefit. Okay. In this particular case with, with GH and IGF-1, you will get leaner and more muscle mass when you use more. Okay, so that's now, one. I did say, though, there's an upper limit. So get it, you know, going to 9 and or 18 a day, then it's, it's, it's overkill. Of course. But there's that, you know, we'll call it a sweet spot there where you still get more out of it with exogenous if you're a bodybuilder. Okay, gotcha. Awesome. Thanks, Doc. Well, as I said, we got one more on this batch. And, and it's a and girl. Again, thank you, ladies. We got <laughs> two out of, what, six this time? That's awesome. Um, so Amber says, hi, Dr. Ran. I'm a 30-year-old female looking to build more muscle in the gym. I have heard that testosterone injections can help, but I am concerned about the possible masculinizing, masculinizing sorry, effects of testosterone, and I'm not sure what dose is appropriate for me. I've never been on TRT replacement no health or medical issues, and not taking any other medications or injectables. I read that female dosing of testosterone injections should be roughly one-tenth that of male dosages. What are your recommendations for testosterone supplementation in females looking to add a little more muscle while minimizing possible side effects? Thank you, Amber. So great, this is a good question. And, and Amber, you're correct. In general, one-tenth the dose works pretty well. So if you're using injectable testosterone cypionate, Guys will use 200 milligrams per ml and use an ml a week, again, roughly. And females will use 20 milligram per ml um, uh, strength and use one ml per week. That's a good general guideline for sure. Um, and I would recommend uh, injections in females if you're interested in ease of use. There's no question that guys do better in, 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 in well, clinically speaking, in my practice anyway, with injectables, but females. I don't necessarily see a difference in results, whether they use injectable or a daily cream. Uh, maybe because women just don't need as much testosterone as guys do. But um, I, I, I joke about you know the executive types, if you don't want to be hassled with it, well then you know use the once a week injection and get the same benefits. The difference obviously is in the, you know, if, if you were ever grab a snapshot, you know, you're, you're gonna see more variability in the tighter on a weekly basis, but arguably on a daily basis, you're gonna see way more with the creams. In terms of, um, again, we go back to ease of use, <sighs> times are changing, and I don't wanna make a statement that sounds at all sexist, but uh, you know, if it's my wife, I, I joke I should have bought stock in Sephora a long time ago, because she's got a cream for everything, and, and she's used to putting on this cream and that cream and stuff. Guys, I know times are changing, but not so much, at least in my generation. It was a pain to have to put on shaving cream this morning, right? Um, but uh, so, so to add one more cream, a, a lot of the gals just say, oh, sure, no problem. And, uh, you know, male or female, there are oftentimes is a fear of needles. But man, 
uh, you know, uh, sticking yourself with a needle is, is nothing compared to a lot of things we do. It's mo- I would argue most of it's a mental thing. So to be able to give yourself an injection once a week, to me, beats having to apply a cream every day, wait typically five minutes for it to dry, and then another roughly 25 before you can do anything where you might sweat it off or swim it off if you jump in the pool or whatever. So for ease of use, I would argue uh, it's great. Um, one thing I will add, because she mentioned one-tenth the dose, generally speaking, generally speaking also, for replacement therapy, we've talked about how guys will have to get, and we've known this since the 1950s, to at least 800 nan- nanograms per deciliter of testosterone total to get clinical benefit. With females, it's interesting because to get clinical benefit, we're going to see the numbers go off the charts even more. So it freaks out a lot of uh, patients as well as practitioners to see uh, the upper limit of, of uh, normal being tripled to get effect. So we mentioned earlier, um, you know, the guy was joking, I think a female's top of the range is 49. Yeah, to get to a clinical benefit, you typically have to see roughly 150 nanograms per deciliter in a female as your minimum. So triple the high normal. Wow. Now of total, okay, which is just potential, remember that's bound up, to get to a free which is what's useful to you, of roughly the top of the range for 4.2 picograms per milliliter. Okay, just the way female bodies work. There's more of that total bound than with a male. So I hope that's uh, helpful to all the ladies out there that are considering TRT. 35 years old by definition, by the way. Um, I, I want to I want to spew all the stuff I can about female TRT because <laughs> we don't get these opportunities. I know about females that I much. Know. Uh, you know, by definition, pretty much where perimenopause starts. So, you know, again, without knowing uh, whether you're a candidate by the numbers or by your, your, your symptoms and, and signs, uh, you know, the age is one that typically jibes anyway. Um, let me make sure I'm answering everything. Uh, oh, masculinizing effects. So, testosterone is not as big a culprit in all this as one of its metabolites, dihydrotestosterone is. In terms of the androgens, testosterone's not that bad. Uh, dihydrotestosterone's pretty bad with men and women. So with either one, in order to reduce those side effects, we want to block the conversion from testosterone into dihydrotestosterone. Now, first of all, though, any of the masculinization that occurs is either in your genes or it's not. So if you're going to get those hairs, and, and we forget this, Men and women have hair in the same places. Women just tend to have a lot less of it. It depends upon if you're recessively gened or or not. Um, and we can go on and on. Even with recessively gene, in other words, you know the typical recessive gene uh, Norwegian, you know, with the blue eyes and the fair skin and the and the and the very fine uh, hair and the attached earlobes. I go on and on about phenotypes that have to do with recessive genes. Can still get you know hairy arms, let's say which you associate more with the dominant genes and masculinization. Um, but grandma probably had you know, a few hairs on her chin that you didn't notice until she got tired of plucking them when she was 70, she just didn't care anymore. But they started about this age, and again, in your genes or not, but furthered by the exposure to dihydrotestosterone. So we can limit some of that, in other words, some of those side effects by limiting the amount of dihydrotestosterone Produce and there will be more produced, presumably, if you add some of the substrate testosterone to the equation early on, or later on, I should say. Um, so one of the ways to block that is with a, a drug called finasteride. It's a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. That 5-alpha reductase is this enzyme that either in the liver or locally uh, will convert testosterone into dihydrotestosterone, cause some of the problems, whether it's the excess hair growth or actually women can lose hair on top of their head too just in the same pattern, male pattern baldness as, as, as uh, men do. Um, acne, same as guys. Um, doctors used to use spironolactone, which is a diuretic, aldactone. Um, but I don't care if you're not an athlete. I do, I'd like to try and get you to be more athletic, any of my patients, and most of them are. But one of the worst things you could do for your athletic prowess, if you will, is to be dehydrated. Yeah. Why would you use spironolactone unless you had a concurrent problem like hypertension that you wanted to treat by using a diuretic? Why would you want to dehydrate someone when you can use something specific to your issue here, which is excess conversion into DHT, 
and that's pretty much all it does. When I say pretty much, there are other hormones that are created, like dihydroprogesterone or uh, 5 allopregnenolone things that you know might be useful to you too, but for the most part, people don't notice that you might be producing less of it by blocking this enzyme, 5 alpha-reductase, but um, it's an easy fix. It's very cheap, this drug, finasteride. You've heard about it because the brand names are ProScar and Propecia when mm-hmm. it's man- it manufactured and distributed and sold, I guess, uh, pr- promoted to, to guys for, for, for either hair loss or uh, prostate enlargement. So we have an easy fix to... to um, I didn't know girls would take it. Okay. Oh, That's absolutely. Okay. It's, it's a much better choice, arguably, than spironolactone. <clears throat> and, and I see more and more doctors using that instead of spironolactone. Oh, good. Um, so let me just make sure we got all... So masculinizing effects that's that's the big one um i don't know of any other side effects that she might mention that i might be missing other than she specifically mentioned masculinization right yep yep awesome thanks doc